summary of the lecture will give a brief introduction about epidemiology, anatomy and physiology and stroke subtypes. Then we will go for stroke diagnosis, mainly focusing on ischemic stroke, CT, MR and advanced techniques. We will briefly talk about hemorrhagic stroke and we will leave the other ones for the workshop. So regarding stroke epidemiology is the third leading cause of death in the developing countries. So it's actually a huge um, a burden for the, the societies and <coughs> less than 10% of the strokes are actually uh, the patients are uh, eligible for received thrombolysis which would be the best treatment. The, the greatest uh, challenging of imaging is that if we can actually increase the number of patients that can receive this best treatment. So regarding the vascular anatomy, you, we will have two internal uh, carotid arteries that will bifurcate into middle cerebral arteries and anterior cerebral arteries, and then we have the vertebral basilar system with the two vertebral arteries, the basilar artery, that will give rise to the posterior cerebral arteries, superior cerebellar arteries, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. And these are the major arteries supplying the brain that have uh, the most important arterial territories. So each time we have a stroke um, in one uh, of these territories due to the occlusion of one of these arteries, we will have a specific topographic uh, lesion as you see here on this drawing showing in different colors the different territories of different arteries. This is not static as the arteries may have variations and there are different types of collateral circulation that allows you to, for the area of the stroke be bigger or smaller than what has been shown here. So 85 to 87% of, of strokes are of ischemic nature due to the uh, occlusion of an artery, a major cortical artery or a small artery. So we will devote most of our attention to the ischemic stroke. Then 13 to 15 percent of the strokes will be hemorrhagic and we can split them in two major categories, brain hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. If the, the hemorrhage is inside the, the parenchyma or in the subarachnoid space. Regarding ischemic stroke, you may have the different causes, thromboembolic, meaning artery to artery thrombo, uh, thromboembolism, cardioembolism, small vessel dis, uh, disease and small vessel occlusion. Then you have other etiology, vasculitis, dissection, where that would be important in young patient. And sometimes actually we cannot depict what was the cause of the stroke. So. How do we should approach a stroke case? The first thing that should come to our mind is, is this a stroke? So we have to rule out stroke mimics and rule out other causes of stroke like TIAs, venous thrombosis and hypertensive encephalopathy press. So there are also non-vascular diseases that may present with acute neurological deficits and mimic a stroke. This would be the case for encephalitis. This would be the case for tumors or even subdural hematomas. So regarding the stroke mimics, the most common causes are the epileptic seizures and the post-ictal paralysis, the psychogenic disorders, the converters, and the migraine associated with neurological deficits. Then you have encephalitis, brain tumor, and a vast amount of other diseases that may present with acute neurological deficits and mimic stroke. Then the second question that we have to answer is, is there hemorrhage and to split into ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke? For ischemic stroke, it is important to define the extension of the infarction, the arterial occlusion site, and if there is still brain to be sol salvaged. So these are the, the three or four P's, parenchymal, pipe, perfusion and penumbra. So let's look at what is the extension of the infarction. 
Since we, the first method is generally a CT, we should be able to depict early signs of infarction, as the insular ribbon sign, which is a loss of gray-white matter uh, interface at the insular area. We have also obscuration or hypodensity of the lenticular nucleus with the loss of white to gray matter interface. And as you see again here, the loss of uh, gray-white matter interface and here with also the effacement of the soul side in an acute stroke setting. So the stroke are also associated with some gyral swelling, sulci infacement, and sometimes they may present also with mass effect, especially later on on the evolution. Here you see the loss of gray-white matter differentiation and the sulci infacement on the stroke area. Another case where you can see also the, the hypodensity, the parenchymal hypodensity and the loss of gray-white matter interface with an asymmetry of the sulci with infacement on the side of the stroke. Whenever you have a hypodensity on the brain, this means that this tissue is irre irreversible uh, damage. So uh, that's uh, not be able to, um, to, to, to cure. And it also ha has uh, the larger the area of hypodensity, the higher the risk for hemorrhagic transformation, especially on middle cerebral artery infarction if there is the involvement of more than one third of its territory. As we go to the, uh, to the late phase, you may have also the parenchymal um, hypodensity as you see here and starting with the mass effect, you see here the middle line shift uh, due to a subfalcine brain herniation and mass effect. So when you look into the stroke guidelines, you see that a frank hypodensity or non-contrast NNCT may increase the risk of hemorrhage. So if you have more than one third of the MCA territory involved, uh, you may consider not giving intravenous thrombolysis even in uh, the time window. So as you go to the late chronic phase, you will have the destruction of the, bra the brain with encephalomalacia lesions. You may have also uh, the brain atrophy with the enlargement of the ventricles and sulci and the pyramidal valerian degeneration as you see with a hypodensity and atrophy along the um, uh, pyramidal track. Uh, it's also important to be able to communicate with other professions. So uh, when you want to actually um, uh, explain how severe uh, it's the stroke, especially on MCA territory, you should consider classifying by the aspect score. And for this aspect score, the, the brain is divided in different areas. For each one, you will give one uh, if it's normal or zero if he has signs of stroke. So you can go from a normal CT aspect stand to a complete MCA uh, infarction aspect zero. And the prognosis, of course, will be different. You can look in, into the web page and try yourself the tests that are um, available online. MR is much more sensitive and specific for infarction. You can actually do a complete uh, stroke protocol in less than 20, mi 20 minutes. You include diffusion and the ADC maps, which are the most sensitive imaging method to uh, depict ischemia in the uh, hyperacute phase. You can do your T2 and flare imaging, SWI or T2 star for look for hemorrhage, perfusion as you see here on arterial spin labeling without contrast, and you can do an aortic arch brain uh, MRA. So T2 star and SWI are at least equivalent, if not better, than CT to depict acute hemorrhage. And of course, MR is better to depict small and lacunar infarction, posterior fossa, fossa infarction, and also to better to predict the outcome of uh, stroke when compared to CT, especially uh, given the information uh, that you can get from the diffusion imaging. So in diffusion imaging, there is a decrease of the ADC which represents intracellular cytotoxic edema. And this is generally a sign of infarction, of the core of the infarction, irreversible lesion. 
We know that some cases, some restricted uh, diffusion lesion may be reversible, but that will be the exception, not the rule. So, and this will occur uh, during the first three hours. So, diffusion can depict ischemia during the first hour after stroke, even sooner of than that. Then the diffusion signal will um, increase during the first week and then decrease and you will have, may have a pseudo-normalization of your ADC uh, values. What about the T2 flare and, and, and the T2? They will be positive in between the third and the eighth hour. If the T2 flare is negative, there is a high probability that the stroke is less than th three hours. So the mismatch between diffusion and the T2 flare can be helpful to determine the time of onset of the stroke when that's not known. And we are talking major uh, when uh, in the wake-up strokes, the patients that wake up with a stroke and we don't know how long, uh, for how long do they have the stroke. So the signs of MR are similar to CT, swollen cortex uh, gyra with increased signal intensity over the area affected infacement of the sulci. Again, you may have a pseudo-normalization of the eye signal between one and four weeks after stroke. T2 star and SWI are very good for looking for hemorrhagic transformation, as you see in this case, or even to see the clot inside the, um, the thrombos inside the artery, as you see here on the MCA and on the branches of the MCA. And also to look to previous hemorrhage, as you see here, on a typical central location microbleeds in hypertension. Of course, small infarction may be very difficult to depict on CT, but easy to depict on uh, MR, especially on diffusion, as you see on this set of images. Lacunar infarction are the caused by the occlusion of small penetrating arteries. Then we have to say, where is the arterial occlusion? And for this, you have some signs, the hyperdense artery sign, as you see here on the middle cerebral artery. This is not an infarction sign. This is a sign of a thrombus inside an artery. Of course, that it's not present in all cases. And you may have false positives with vessel calcification and high hematocrit. So you can use CTA to look at um, uh, an occlusion of the ICA, as you see here, or even MRA um, to uh, depict where is the occlusion. Finally, is there salvage brain? So we looked into perfusion in penumbra. So when you have an occlusion of the artery, we have a decrease of CBF. This decrease of the CBF in the central area will be also associated with decrease of CBV, and you will have an area of infarction. Around the area of infarction, depending on your collateral anastomosis, you will have an area that is suffering but may be reversible. And this area shows a CBV that is normal or increased and an increased circulation time given by an increase of mean transit time or time to peak. So you have this penumbra area around the infarction that will um, go to uh, infarction if you don't do anything. And then you have an area of oligemia, which has uh, reduced CBF, but still neuronal, uh, it's still neuronal intact and will not uh, evolve to infarction. So as time goes by, if you don't treat, all the area of penumbra will become the area of infarction. So you really have to work fast. And as fast as you uh, work, the better the result, the, the lower the core of the infarction will be. Let's look at this case. So acute stroke case, you see an occlusion of the MCA. You look at your maps, you see an increased MTT, normal CBF and normal CBV, meaning that everything is ischemic penumbra, so you don't have an inf a, a core of infarction. That would be an increased MTT area with a decreased um, CBV. So everything would be reversible. Although there was no recanalization, the outcome was bad, and ev all the area was actually involving or uh, evoluting to brain infarction. You can also use uh, this mismatch concept with MR, and you are going to use the increased MTT and the decreased uh, CBV, or an increased MTT and your diffusion abnormalities. 
So um, what about brain hemorrhage? The most common causes are primary chronic hypertension and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. This will account almost to half of the cases in the elderly patients. Then you have the secondary causes, vascular malformations and aneurysms. You have to think that on young patients. And you have tumors, coagulopathy, and many other causes that can um, be responsible for brain hemorrhage. So the hypertensive hemorrhage has mainly a location at the deep uh, uh, nuclei, the putaminal, the thalamus also, the subcortical white matter, the cerebral, and the pontine locations. These are the main targets for hypertensive hemorrhage. What is important, they, they, they result from uh, the rupture of perforating arteries, and this is a typical example of a lenticular um, uh, uh, hematoma. You see no abnormality on the, the CTA, and the evolution will go with the retraction of the hematoma and the forming of a hemosiderin ring and the slit light type of scar of this bleeding. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy, you will, have, um, you will have hemorrhage, lobar hemorrhage in different locations, you may have subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you will have peripheral uh, microbleeds and also white matter disease. It's most commonly a sporadic disease, but you may have irreditary cases. These are most commonly uh, appearing in younger patients. When you are looking into brain hemorrhage, you have to do some um, uh, evaluation of the volume of the hematoma as this is correlated with uh, the prognosis. So you measure the, the diameters in three planes and divide by two. You have also to, uh, to look into the intraventricular extension because if you have intraventricular hemorrhage, there is the risk for hydrocephalus. Can we predict the risk of hematoma expansion? Because we know that almost 30, uh, up to 38% of cases will have an increase on the size of the hematoma during the first 24 hours, mostly during the first three hours, and this is associated with a very bad outcome. Well, if you do a CTA, you may be uh, lucky enough to depict the area of bleeding, as you see here. And this is called the spot signs, contrast uh, signal inside the brain hematoma. You see here on the magnified view, the spot sign, and you see how this patient actually continue to bleed over the time. What about subarachnoid hemorrhage, non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage? The, 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 the diagnosis is made by non-contrast um, uh, CT. In the acute phase, the CT has a very high sensitivity, almost 100%. But the accuracy of CT will decrease over time and will be very low on the subacute phase. For those cases of subacute phase, you may need to do a lumbar puncture to see if there is CSF sanchentochromia or do an MRI and try to look at the T2 flare high signal on the subarachnoid space and uh, also uh, the low signal on your T2 star or SWI imaging. It's important to classify the, the grade of the subarachnoid hemorrhage accordingly with the fissure grade because the higher the fissure grade, the, the worse the prognosis, especially regarding vasospasm and hydrocephalus. So you go from one where you don't have uh, blood on the CT, just on the lumbar puncture, to the grade four where you have intraventricular um, or parenchymal uh, extension of your subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then you have to look to the cause of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can do it CTA or you can do a DSA. And if your CTA is negative and you really did, uh, suspect of a vascular subarachnoid hemorrhage, then you should go for a DSA. And 80% of the cases are resulting from aneurysmal rupture, 10% are venous on origin and 10% are caused by many other vascular diseases or even tumors. So with this I think we have covered the main objective of imaging in stroke to give you um, an overview of the basic and the more advanced imaging techniques.
Let's now see some uh, cases of a stroke. Let me see how uh, tell you how I report a stroke case. So the first thing I think is this a stroke. So I have to rule out stroke mimics and other causes of stroke. Then is there hemorrhage to separate between ischemic and is, uh, hemorrhagic stroke? If it's ischemic, what is the extension of the infarction? Where is the arterial occlusion? Is there salvage brain? Then, for the extension, I will look into the topography and vascular territory that is affected, and I quantify it, if it's possible for a MCI infarction, by the aspect score. For the penumbra, I use the CT perfusion or the MR perfusion mismatch and I will try to, to quantify the penumbra area and the core area. Then the arterial occlusion, depending on uh, if I'm doing a CT or MR, I will do an angiographic view. For the hemorrhagic uh, stroke, uh, we have to divide it in cerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then again, what is the extension? For parenchyma hemorrhage, the volume and mass effect are important. For subarachnoid hemorrhage, the fissure gray. Don't forget to, to report if there is interventricular extension and hydrocephalus. Then what is the cause? It's a parenchymal hemorrhage, looks like hypertensive, cerebral amyloid, or has an atypical location that might suspect other causes. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, try to look where is the hemorrhage. So starting with this female with 78 years old with acute onset less than three hours of right hemiparesis and global aphasia and uh, any age stroke scale of seven. And this is uh, a, a representative picture of the CT scan. And this is the CTA that it was performed to MIP slabs. The findings in the CTA are left ICA occlusion, left MCA occlusion, basilar artery occlusion, normal CTA. Let's look again to the images. The correct answer was left MCA occlusion. Of course, we don't see the distal part of the MCA and there is a re reduced amount of vessels in the territory of the MCA. Then we proceed to the perfusion study. And here we have the MTT maps, the CBF maps, and the CBV maps of this patient. And the question is, the findings in the CT perfusion are large penumbra defect in the left MCA territory without infarction core, large core defect in the left MCA territory without mismatch, Penumbra and core defects with a small penumbra, less than one-third of MCA territory, on normal CTP without penumbra or core. Large penumbra defect in the M uh, left MCA territory without infarction core. The CBV is quite normal as you see here, but you have an increased MTT along the area of the MCA uh, territory. So you see here, large uh, increased MTT, no decreased CBV, so everything will be penumbra. Will the penumbra of brain tissue show evolution to infarction if there is no vessel or too late vessel recanalization? Yes or no? Yes, so as you see here, if there is no recanalization, all the area in penumbra will actually go for stroke and brain death. So as sooner as you act in these patients, the higher, the, the largest the area of the brain tissue that you are able to save. Let's see another uh, uh, case, female, 50, uh, 58 years old, with right lower limb paresis and a wake-up stroke. So the problem here is the unknown time of symptom onset. It could be 10 minutes, 2 hours, or even more. 
Can we estimate the onset of the stroke with MR? Yes or no? Yes, we can do it. We can use the diffusion and the flare images to look at the area um, to try to predict the time. If we have already uh, uh, flare images abnormalities, means that the time of onset is for sure more than four and a half hours. So it's outside the time window for intravenous treatment. Can MRI perfusion be helpful to decide the best treatment approach after four and a half hours the stroke onset? Yes or no? Yes, again. And this is uh, if you do your uh, perfusion imaging, you look if there is still penumbra tissue using diffusion as the core of the, the infarction and MTT as the po possible penumbra area. And um, in this case, the, the, the mismatch between perfusion and diffusion will give you the possible salvage brain. So, uh, CT perfusion and MR perfusion and diffusion imaging may be considered for the selection of patients uh, for acute perfusion therapy beyond time window for intravenous thrombolysis. This is a guideline for stroke management. So, you may consider if there's still a mismatch to go for interarterial mechanical treatment. And in this case, actually, you see there was no perfusion diffusion mismatch, so it was no salvage brain, so there is, was actually, we were too late.